I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. And I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and the honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Yesterday I went on a picnic out in the country. Fine, thank you. And I saw the most beautiful butterflies. I didn't know that butterflies. No, not that kind of butter. Butter can't fly. Anybody knows that. I mean, butterflies. Oh, yes, the ones with beautiful wings. And we caught several of them, and I'm starting to make a collection of butterflies. Well, I think that's a nice idea. And at night, my father caught a great big blue moth. Oh, he did? Mm-hmm. It's bigger than a butterfly. It's the luna moth. Oh, yes, yes, I know them. They're a light bluish green. But when they die, the blue coloring fades away, and they become white. Oh, they do? Yes, but a luna moth would look lovely in your collection. Well, that's very interesting. I'll tell my father that. Yes, do that. Oh, now could we please read the funny? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweetle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> Beetle comes into the sergeant's office. He walks over and leans on the sergeant's desk and says, Sarge. Why don't I ever get a promotion like the other guys? The sergeant goes, How can you ask me a thing like that? Come here. Sit in my chair. Put yourself in my place for a minute. Now pretend I'm you. I've just been AWOL. I've been goofing off on the PX all week. Flunked inspection. Fouled up the whole company. I tromp in, my hat on, lean on your desk, and ask, Sarge, why don't I get a promotion? Last picture, top row, Beetle leaps to his feet. You got a nerve asking me a thing like that? First picture, bottom row, he slaps the sergeant to the face. You lazy, good-for-nothing chowhound. He knocks the sergeant to the floor. Hey! He jumps on him. It's all I can do to control myself. Hey! I try to be kind and understanding, and this is the thanks I get. Now get out of here before I lose my temper. No. And last picture. Beetle walks by the sergeant who is lying on the ground. The sergeant shakes his head. Uh, at least he knows how I feel about him now. Beetle says to himself, I think I'll ask him for a promotion tomorrow. <laughs> Beetle never will get a raise in salary if he treats the sergeant like that. Well, I don't think Beetle was thinking about getting a raise in salary. I think he enjoyed beating the sergeant up. That way, he got even with the sergeant for all the things the sergeant had done to him. Oh, he just used this as an excuse to beat the sergeant? <laughs> yes, that's what oh, I think. Well, and that's why he wants to ask him for a promotion again tomorrow so he can beat him up again? <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> oh, that beetle, he's some fellow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. Well, now let's turn over the page and go past little iodine and Prince Val, who's having an audience with King Rory, one of the famous kings of Ireland. Turn over that page, and here on page five is Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, and you remember last week Roy walked into a trap that was set for him at the covered bridge. Yes, he fell through a trap door and was knocked unconscious. And then a moment later, Ham Hawks, the outlaw who had captured Dangerfield, owner of the carnival, rode up. And Hawks said that he was going to shoot Roy. I wonder if he will. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. A yip by o now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by o Roy lies.
lies unconscious on the bridge. Ham Hawks, gun in hand, walks toward him. Dangerfield shouts, Stop! You can't do this! It's murder! Shut up and stay away, Dangerfield. Hawk stops beside Roy, raises his pistol. Suddenly, Dangerfield, with a courage born of desperation, whips off his cape and with a leap throws it over Hawk's head. I watch you. The gun goes off in the excitement, but misses Roy. Hawk shakes Dangerfield off. Last picture, top row. Roy, Roy, destroy yourself. Help! Aid! Sucker! At this moment, Roy opens his eyes and through dazed eyes sees Hawks going for Dangerfield. Roy pulls his gun, first picture bottom row, and snaps. All right, Ham Hawks, freeze. Rogers, you. Don't move. Hawks lifts his arms. Now, Dangerfield, you saved my life. Dangerfield strikes a dramatic pose and boasts. My strength was as the strength of ten, Roy, because my heart is pure. Meanwhile, at the camp, Wildwood O'Dowd is guarding the two captured outlaws that Roy left in her hands. They've been sitting in the sun. Hard Rock Higgins asks for a drink of water. Wildwood O'Dowd scoops a cup of it out of the pail. Then goes to him and holds out the cup. Well, come a little closer. I can't do nothing with my arms and legs tied. Wildwood takes a step closer. Last picture, Higgins leans forward as though to drink from the cup. Then suddenly swings his head up and hits Wildwood a vicious blow on the jaw. Yeah, I guess that takes care of her. captured Ham Hawk, then these other two are going to escape. That means more trouble. Yes, it does, because Roy thinks these two outlaws are tied up safely. Oh, I wonder how this will ever turn out. Well, maybe next week we'll find out about it. Now, let's turn over the page. Oh, and look here on page six. Here's Uncle Remus. I just love him. So do I. So let's read Uncle Remus right now. Here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Bro Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make it a habit to give us music for old Bro Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, When Mammy Bammy tells Bro Rabbit's fortune, she generally hits it on the head. Bro Rabbit is having his future told by Mammy Bammy, who does it by feeling the bumps on Rabbit's head. That's called Phrenology. First picture, she says, I sees by the phrenology bumps on your head that you is gonna get a big spry. I is? Yes, sir. This here big lump says it's coming fast and quick. I is? Yes, sir, Briar Rabbit. Tonight you is in for a big surprise. Well, well, that's good news. I better get going. Last picture, top row, Briar Rabbit goes out of her tent. Thanks for the free knowledge, Mammy Bammy. I don't want to keep my big surprise waiting. And he dashes down the road. First picture, bottom row, he says. Yeah, I, I wonder if I'm going to get my big surprise before I get home. He looks back over his shoulder to see if he can see his surprise. And then crashes into a tree. And all goes black. And then came the light. Several hours later, Br'er Rabbit comes to. He's lying in bed, and old Doc Crane has taken his pulse. Br'er Rabbit groans. What happened? Uh, you did. I surprised to see that you is living. Last picture, Br'er Rabbit groans. Uh, I guess that's the big surprise I was in for. And Uncle Remus says, The reward is often in what didn't happen. Oh, oh. wasn't that too bad? Yes, little old rabbit. 
Brer Rabbit expects to get a wonderful surprise, and instead... He forgets to look where he's going and bangs into a tree. Well, that was some surprise. <laughs> yes, and Mammy Bammy said he would get it that night. Well, he did. <laughs> I guess that's the way most of the time with fortune tellers. Yes, from my own experience, I would say that nothing I was told that would happen to me ever came true. Nothing good, that is. Me neither. But I can tell you right now, if you'll pick up the first page of the second section... We can read Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and I'm anxious to read that because Dagwood does such funny things. Yes, he does. Well, here we go on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafoo, Ramafum, Zim, Zim, Zombie. Come to me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Blondie tells Dagwood. Dagwood, the professor is coming today to give Cookie her first violin lesson. Oh, good. I have to shop. Can you take care of things while I'm away? Oh, sure. Now, stop worrying, Blondie. Remember, I'm an old musician myself. A short time later, the doorbell rings. Dagwood goes to the door and opens it. And last picture, top row, in comes the professor of music. Well, professor, welcome. Your pupil's all ready. Uh, grazie, grazie, grazie. First picture, second row. The music professor sits down in front of Cookie. Buongiorno. Cookie sits down in front of the music professor. Huh? She looks at him. He is a little queer-looking fellow. A bald head with bushy locks of hair that grow out from behind his ears and the back of his neck. He's wearing baggy trousers, a black coat, and a big flourishing tie. And he has big, bushy eyebrows, a long nose, and a big, big, curly mustache. He holds up the violin and says, E now, Cookie, this is what I call a violin. This is the front, and this is the back of it. Uh-huh. Where do you blow it? <laughs> oh, no, no, darling. This, you don't play with the mouth. You play with the arm. Oh, you, uh, you mean you blow on the arm? Oh, no, 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 darling. This is what you... Second picture, second row. Dagwood is upstairs rummaging in the attic. Daisy, the dog, watches him curiously. Daisy, I'll bet you you never knew I played trombone in our school band. Now, where did Mama hide it? Ah, here it is. Dagwood trots down the stairs. And into the living room. So, you see, Cookie. You play it with the bow, which is this long stick. Dagwood quietly puts his trombone to his mouth, last picture, second row, and... <laughs> and the scared professor is lying on the floor. First picture, third row, he gets up. Picks up his violin and music, muttering to himself. Hey, uh, professor, you mind if I sit and watch the lesson? Uh, maybe I can learn something. The professor says nothing. Sits down in silent anger. Grits his teeth. Now, professor, don't pay any attention to me. You just go ahead as though I weren't here. Last picture, third row. The professor holds up a sheet of music. Looks at Dagwood angrily. Then points to one of the notes and says to Cookie. Now, that's what we call a full note. First picture, bottom row. Dagwood jumps to his feet. Puts his trombone to his mouth and... Hey, I stuck it up and just my tube. <laughs> and the professor is on the floor again. Dagwood smiles. A full note. And I am a fool. Way up to my ears are these interruptions. A moment later, the door opens. And in comes Blondie. And out goes the professor without saying a word. Blondie turns to Cookie. Did the professor give you your lesson, Cookie? No, but he taught Pop a lesson. And last picture, Blondie walks into the living room. And there sits Dagwood with his trombone wrapped around his neck. Blondie takes one look at him. Whom do you call to remove a trombone from a person's neck? Dagwood gives her a thunderous look. Try a plumber. Professor taught Dagwood a lesson for budding in. Yes, you bet he did. And now he's all tied up in his music. Oh, oh that's funny. <laughs> oh, yes. We always love Dagwood and Blondie, don't we? Yes. Well, now let's turn over the page. Oh, look. There's 
Flash Gordon, and I'm anxious to read that. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the second page of the second section, Flash Gordon. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Rega rega doon doon saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash, Dale, Midas, and the pilot have been captured by the giant on the planet Titan. The pilot, in desperation, starts to run away, hoping to escape. Midas shouts, Hey, look, George is making a break for it. Stop, you fool! As the giant bends down and scoops up George, Flash says, Here, this is our chance. It's now or never. Everybody scatter. Some of us are sure to get out of here. Last picture, top row, they make a dash for freedom. First picture, bottom row, the giant tosses George to the ground and starts after the others. Flash, hearing the steps, stops and heaves the basket into the path of the unrushing giant. The giant trips on the basket and falls. Last picture. Flash shouts, All right, I stopped him. Come on, Dale, fast! <laughs> Lucky that Flash tripped the giant? You bet it was. Do you think they will escape now? Well, that's hard to say. That giant is so big that when he gets to his feet, remember, he can cover a lot of ground fast. Of that, I'm sure. Oh, I, I hope they get away. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. But now I'm sure you'd like to find out what happens next in Walt Disney's story, The Sword and the Rose. Oh, yes, I'd love to. All right, then, let's turn over the page. And here on page four of the second section is The Sword and the Rose. And this story is wonderful, and it's long ago in England when Henry was the king. And the king's sister, Mary Tudor, had fallen in love with a man named Charles Brandon, who was captain of the guards. But King Henry wants Mary to marry the king of France, but she said she wouldn't do it, and the king was furious. That's very angry, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And then she sent for Brandon to come to see her. But instead, his friend Caskadin came and told Mary that Charles Brandon was leaving the country. That's because he loved Mary, and he thought that he would cause her trouble by staying in England. But I hope he doesn't go away, because I want him to marry Mary. I wonder what will happen. Well, let's read now and see what happens next. Here we go with the sword and the rose. It's merry, merry England, when knighthood was in flower. Music to bewitch our story hour. Charles Brandon has resigned his captaincy in the King's Guard and has gone aboard a ship that is preparing to sail to the New World. Aboard the Royal Hind, the name of the ship, in Bristol Harbor, he waits for a westerly wind that will take him away from England and the impetuous princess who has kindled his love. He sits at a table thinking, Ah, it could never be. Lady Mary was born to marry royally. Not a mere guardsman as I. Last picture, top row, he's roused from his reverie by the opening of a door. And he sees a figure standing in the doorway, draped in a cape. And a voice says, Charles. First picture, second row, Charles stares in surprise. He recognizes the voice. And then hears the captain of the ship shout, Way anchor! Through the open door, Charles sees the ship's men spring to action, hoisting the sails. Quickly, he closes the door. And last picture, second row, exclaims, Princess Mary. Mary tells him to be quiet. And she says that she has told the captain that she is shipping with Brandon, who is his master. First picture, bottom row, Brandon exclaims, Why, you must be mad. No ship's captain will permit a woman on so long a voyage. Mary removes her cloak and says... May not a gentleman take his page wherever he goes? And Brandon sees she looks like a boy dressed in a page's costume. He stares at her in amazement. Princess Mary, you'd hazard this for me? Mary looks at him with love in her eyes and says, I've defied my brother and spurned the king of France for you. Last picture, as Brandon tries to persuade Mary of the folly of attempting to masquerade as his page, an alert seaman pauses outside Brandon's cabin. The seaman hears the voices inside, turns to another and exclaims, 
a woman's voice. Yes, it was. That was because she loved him. Yes, it is. I hope Charles Brandon lets her go along because I, I don't want them to be separated. And neither do I. But but look at that tough-looking man who's listening at the door there. You think he's discovered their secret? Well, I'm afraid we'll have to wait until next week to find that out. But now let's go to the very last page of the Comic Weekly and see what's happening to Dick. Oh, yes. Because he's having a very exciting adventure. He's in the early days of America. Yes, in the state of California. And gold was discovered at a place not too far from where Dick was. And everybody in the town rushed off to try to dig for gold themselves. And Dick has finally persuaded his friend, Editor Campbell, to join the gold seekers. And last week they started out. I wonder what will happen. W will they find gold this week? Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Rickety pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick and Editor Kemble have become part of the frenzied march to wealth, later to become known as the California Gold Rush of 1849. As they near the banks of the river, they hear sounds of anger rise from the crowd of gold seekers. The only way to get across the river is by a ferry boat, and the crowd is objecting to the high price the ferry boat owner is charging to take them across. First picture, second row, Dick hears the ferry boat owner say, All the gold's on the other side of the river, gents. I'm only asking a paltry $25 a head to ferry you over. Now get aboard if you're coming. All right, I'll pay it, but it's an outrage. Outraged, Kemble upbraids upraged the ferryman as a brigand and a thief. But a gold-hungry mob swarms aboard just the same. As the ferry boat pushes off, loaded with men, last picture, second row, Campbell thunders, I just won't be made a fool of by that thievish rascal. We'll find another way to get across, Dick. Dick watches as the boat pulls away from shore. And then he sees it caught by the current and swept out into the middle of the stream. Then suddenly, Dick stands petrified with horror. <coughs> The boat is caught by a swirling current and smashed against the rock. It begins to sink and fall apart. Hey, help me out! Hey, we're sinking! We're sinking! Help! Help! Every man aboard is pitched into the rushing river. And last picture, while those on shore are fishing out some very wet gold hunters, the rascally ferryman is yelling lustily from a rock in midstream. A thousand dollars to the man who saved me! Boat. So am I, because even though some of the people are being saved, it's quite possible that many of them will be drowned. And Dick's just a little boy, and he might not be strong enough to swim all the way back to shore. No, not against that swift current. I wonder if anybody will save that greedy ferry boat captain. Well, next week we'll find that out. But now, look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And you remember that Rusty and Tex were taking a very valuable horse back to the Milestone Farm. But a man named Velvet Kane, who doesn't want the horse to get to Milestone Farm, has sent two of his men to delay Tex and Rusty. And these men set up a sign that led Tex off the road through the forest and up beside a shack, and there's no room for Tex to turn his truck around. So Tex has gone out in the dark to chop trees down to make a clearing so he can turn the truck around. But one of Kane's men is going to blow the bridge up if Tex can turn the truck around. Yeah, but don't forget that last week the sheriff discovered the displaced detour sign and has decided to investigate. I wonder if the sheriff will get there in time. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> After chopping for hours, Tex finally says, Ah, well, Rusty, I reckon we've cleared enough of these saplings to turn the van around. We better get rolling. But Tex, I've been thinking of what you told me, though, about Mr. Ma's trouble. How can it save Milestone Farm if we get Silver Lad to Lexington by tomorrow? Well, Rusty, I'll tell you. There's a big shot from South America who'll buy every yearling milestone can raise. If we can prove we got a stallion of the line of gallant corporal. 
Oh, I see, Tex. And Silver Lad is the only one alive. Last picture, top row, Tex says. That's right, son. And this senor Calderas leaves for South America tomorrow. Now, if we don't produce Silver Lad, the contract goes to Velvet Kane, and the bank won't extend Mr. Miles' loans. Well, golly, let's get going. I'll put this axe back in the cabin where I borrowed it from. First picture, bottom row, Rusty, as we turn the axe to the house. The wind has blown some letters to the floor. Rusty begins to pick them up. As he picks up one letter, Rusty looks at it and then exclaims, Hey, oh, Jiminy, wow, wait till I tell Tex about this. And a moment later, Tex is saying, But Rusty, are you sure? You positive you read it right? Positive, Tex. Three letters addressed to Mr. Markey at Great Oaks Farm. Isn't that Velvet Kane's place? Meanwhile, in the car behind the cabin, Scrub, one of Kane's men, is watching the house carefully. He says to himself, That big cowpoke starts. Well, two blasts on this horn, and Porky will blow a truss out from under the bridge. And last picture. Not far off, a curious sheriff approaches the cabin with two deputies. Then the sheriff stumbles. Hey! Hey, what's up, Bert? Why, there seems to be a wire running through the grass. I tripped on it. The other deputy says, Yeah, but there don't seem to be no sign of hijackers like you thought. Oh, I'm glad Rusty found that letter because I'm sure that made Tex suspect that something is wrong. I think so, too. And if the sheriff, fo sheriff follows that wire, he'll find Porky or else he'll find the dynamite. And then maybe he can stop them from blowing up the bridge. Well, let's hope he finds it before Tex starts to get in his truck. Oh, yes, because the minute Tex gets in his truck, Scrub will give the signal and then Porky will blow up the bridge. I wonder what will happen. Well, we'll find out for sure next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tony Greedy Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>